Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Clifford Berger and I provide perspectives on life and style for men in midlife. I have a blog and website that I call A Seasoned Life and you can find that at cliffordberger.com. Today I'm going to talk about something a little different. I'm going to talk about baseball, more specifically the semiotics of baseball and what makes baseball unique. Now why am I thinking of that? Well, it's springtime. Uh, Major League Baseball is underway. College Baseball is uh, in full swing, so to speak. And so uh, for those of us who are fans of the game, our thoughts are on that. Now, uh, be mindful. I'm not presenting myself as an authority on baseball. M many people know way more about it than I do. But uh, I enjoy baseball and I appreciate the history and the nuances of it and there are a couple things several things well nine things specifically that i wanted to um, kind of mention that uh, connect to what i would call the semiotics of baseball now semiotics as you might recall is the study of signs symbols imagery narrative metaphor that sort of thing and uh, i think baseball is rather rich with those things and so i wanted to point out some of those i have a post on this on my website and you may want to visit that as well uh, where i unpack them to a greater degree i'll just mention them here and i also on my post on my website i make some connections to how those things uh, speak into our life development as individuals as men in particular uh, I won't go into that so much in this, but I do want to hit on those nine things. Um, I, I have here uh, a visual aid. This is a, uh, a baseball glove that had belonged to my wife's father, my, my father-in-law, who had passed away 20 years ago now. Um, but this was his baseball glove back when he was uh, probably a teenager, Maybe in the, it looks like it dates maybe to the 1940s. Look at this. Um, it's remarkable uh, that uh, the, the even the equipment has evolved the way it has. Uh, this this glove isn't isn't much. It's just a little thing to put on your hand. I have it on the wall normally behind me as a kind of a, a decoration in my in my study. But uh, I was looking at that the other day, and that gave me a little bit of the inspiration for this video. So uh, without further ado, uh, here are nine things, no accident that it's nine, that make baseball unique, that kind of tie into the semiotics of baseball. The first being that oftentimes baseball is seen as uh, is critiqued as being slow, uh, not having as much action as some of the other major team sports. Well, to some degree, this is true. It doesn't have uh, nonstop action. The action tends to be intermittent and uh, um, periodic, and it tends to build up intensity near the end of a game. And I realize that in other games, too, other sports, um, that's, that tends to be the case. The end of a football game, game can be uh, a real nail-biter nail for sure. But that's no less true in baseball. You just have to wait for it sometimes. Because in baseball, um, disappointment can be immediate and gratification can be delayed, so to speak. So that would be one of the things. Don't expect nonstop action from baseball because uh, that isn't the way the game is built. The second thing is that ballparks are unique one from another. In other sports, the dimensions of the, the court or the field uh, are more uniform than they are in baseball. In baseball, you know, certain parts of it are uh, according to regulation, such as the distance from the pitcher's mound to the uh, to home plate, uh, the height of the rubber on the mound relative to home plate, the distance between bases, 
and so on. But beyond that, there are considerable considerable variable, variables, especially in uh, terms of the outfield, which is where batters are most often wanting to be hitting the ball. The distance to the to right, center, and left field can vary from one ballpark to another. And hitters, batters, and fielders both have to adjust themselves to those variables uh, in, in one ballpark or another. And so it kind of gives new meaning to the whole idea of home field advantage when there is actually more to it than just the friendliness of the fans that are in the stands. Uh, one notable variable, uh, again, is the distance to uh, the outfield wall and even the height of the wall. Um, in Fenway Park in Boston, for example, the distance to the left field fence is a relatively modest 315 feet. But to compensate for that, in 1934, they constructed what has become known as the Green Monster, this 37-foot left field wall that makes it very difficult to hit a home run over the left field fence in Fenway Park, even though the distance to the, to the uh, fence uh, or to the wall is more modest. So it's just some of those kind of variables that uh, make the game interesting, make it unique in that way. Then number four, and this is important, this is one of my favorite points, there is no clock in baseball. There is uh, a, a complete uh, nine inning game. Each team has 27 outs uh, with which to attempt to win the game in a complete game if it doesn't go short or extra innings. No team will be beaten by the clock. There's no such thing as taking a knee. There's no such thing as garbage minutes in baseball because theoretically a team, even if they're considerably down, can still rally and come back and win the game. The odds may be against them. And we've all seen that where it just seems insurmountable to overcome, but at least in theory, a team can come back and win the game even against tremendous odds. And sometimes they have. And that's part of what makes the game uh, so compelling. You will never be beaten by a clock. A team wins or loses based on their own merits. Number four, it's the only game that I know of where the defense has the ball. Most of the time, uh, in team sports, the offense has the ball or the scoring device, and they're trying to get the, uh, the device uh, across the, the goal line that's being defended by the other team. In baseball, it's so counterintuitive. Uh, the, the batter tries to get the ball as far away from themselves as possible. The further away it is, the better their chance of scoring. And uh, then the ball is in the hands of the defense to do something with. Scoring doesn't require invading the other team's territory that they're defending. Rather, it calls for the, the uh, batter who turns into the runner to circulate the bases and come back home where they started. They started at home and they end at home. Ideally, they, they return home. Have you ever noticed that home plate is shaped like a little house? Look at that the next time. It's, it's got the shape of a little roof and a little house. How cool is that? Well, number number uh, five. Short of a home run, in most cases, uh, you need other players to help you advance around the bases. Those who come behind you, batters who come behind you, get hits or walks, and as they get on base and, and move around the bases, then you have a chance uh, to move around the bases too. So it's in some ways a community support kind of thing. You need others in order to score most of the time. Sometimes you can get the big hit, get the home run, and so on. So there's that drama at play too, and one never knows when that's going to happen. <clears throat> but more of the time, scoring is incremental 
and it requires the support of others. Sometimes it even requires uh, sacrifice on the part of one player who may hit what has come to be called a sacrifice fly. So they intentionally and willingly allow themselves to uh, hit a fly ball and be uh, taken out only to allow the a runner ahead of them to advance or maybe even to score. So uh, it's kind of like life sometimes. Uh, it involves sacrifice on the part of one person in order for someone else to advance. Anyone who's a parent understands this innately. And uh, even the term sacrifice kind of has religious overtones to it, which is interesting and kind of part of the semiotic. Number six, this is a short one, but players um, don't necessarily advance into other territory to try to take territory and move the ball across something. They start, they, they end where they begin. They advance and they go around and they come back home uh, where they began at home. And uh, uh, that just seems counterintuitive uh, to, to circulate while someone else, the other team on defense, is trying to do something with the ball to get them out. But that is one of the things that makes baseball unique. Number seven, this is also really cool. Only in baseball do you have a game where if no one gets a hit, no one gets on base, and no one scores by any other means, is it known as a perfect game? How counterintuitive is that? Uh, from one perspective, the, per the game could be considered uh, full of flaws, but from another perspective, entirely perfect. That is unique about baseball. Number eight, baseball curates its history like no other sport, uh, obsesses with statistics. And uh, I think that the key part of this is that in baseball, players are not just up against the other team on a given day, but they're actually competing with and against the entire history of the game. This is true in other sports too, to some degree, but baseball curates this aspect of the game like no other. Um, in, in a sense, players are adding to the statistical database of the game, uh, of the sport with every game, uh, both their own statistics as well as how those statistics measure against uh, other players. And I, I find that just unique and compelling. And then lastly, number nine, uh, ninth inning here. Speaking of semiotics, uh, players and coaches literally use uh, signs, hand signals and signs to communicate on the field. Uh, historically, there are no headphones on a baseball field uh, the way there are like in football and, and so on. Uh, typically, those with a better perspective of the field, such as the catcher and the first base or the third base coach, uh, will use signs to communicate to batters and to the pitcher and that sort of thing because certain people uh, have a better perspective of what's happening. For example, the pitcher has his back to much of the, uh, the field, his back to the runners and needs the signals and the communication from the catcher in order to um, plan and strategize uh, the next pitches. And so, um, you know, it is a game of signs. It's a game of symbols. It's a game of imagery. It's a game of history. And uh, in those senses, baseball is certainly unique. Here's an extra inning with which I'll conclude Baseball is kind of an acquired taste. Um, kids sometimes have trouble watching a baseball game because of the fact that it doesn't have that much action. They enjoy playing it more than they uh, may enjoy watching it, although watching it in person is better than watching it on, on television for kids. For a fan, I enjoy watching baseball on television. It's actually a good sport to watch on television, but that's just me. But, uh, you know, because of that, 
uh, don't get involved with a, a baseball game unless you have time to devote to it. If you're on a schedule and you have some place to be at a certain time, you better not plan that around a baseball game because it's not over until it's over. And in that sense, a baseball game is kind of like a restaurant meal, a fine restaurant meal, not fast food, not even, uh, you know, a family dining, but it's more uh, something like when you go out uh, to eat at a fine restaurant and you languish in the experience, you're not expecting things to happen quickly. Uh, the, the service may take its time. Uh, you're, you're appreciating the attention to detail, basically. And uh, you, you don't plan fancy dinners to, to be rushed. You expect them to take time and uh, you expect to enjoy them uh, like the experience that they are. So those are some elements of baseball that I find unique and compelling. And again, in my post on my website, I have compared some of these things to life development issues and I think you might find that interesting as well. So I would encourage you to visit that at cliffordberger.com. And for now, I appreciate you watching, appreciate you listening, and I will see you in the next one.